the principal investigator in the study. That was John Kane, and I want to extend um, his regrets at not being able to be here uh, because he's been um, very active in presenting information about the study and, of course, in the conduct of it. And he would, I know, have uh, greatly enjoyed the opportunity uh, to interact with you all. So I'm the stand-in uh, with that. Um, the um, NIMH program uh, was called and is called RAISE, Recovery After an Initial Schizophrenia Episode. And our part of it, there were two sections of the RAISE program, the NIMH program. One was called RAISE Connection, and ours was called RAISE Early Treatment Program, RAISE ETP. And that's what I'm going to be talking about this morning. And I should tell you is that this was uh, planned as a very data-dense presentation, lots and lots of stuff. And um, as I've been listening uh, this morning and listening to the comments that you all made, I'm, you're going to see me advancing rather quickly through some of the slides, which I think are not precisely what you may want to hear in detail. I know that everybody's been given a copy um, of the slide set earlier. And here's our group. Um, uh, that's John at the top. Uh, that's me. And as you can see, our large group, oh, uh, this is not working for me, our large group that was involved in the program. And this is not even uh, the full extent of the number of people. And I might stop and comment that one of the things that has happened in the world that we live in now is that so much of what we do is actually team science. There are very, very few things. Um, uh, we're not uh, Wilbur and Orville Wright uh, anymore. Um, and so one uh, has to think about teams, and it can be a very exciting prospect to be part of a team that's integrated. And these are our NIMH collaborators, and I especially want to acknowledge um, Bob Heinsohn, uh, to, to whom enormous credit must be given uh, for moving this project uh, forward and for sustaining it. And of course, we had 34 sites. These are our clinicians. These are our sites. And of course, we had many participants in the program. So what we were mandated to do was to think about the first episode of psychosis and how we could treat that in order to maximize recovery. Our goals are not maintenance, to maximize recovery and hopefully change the trajectory of illness over time. And so what I'm going to do now is first I'm going to describe the program that we developed to do this. And then the second mandate that the NIMH gave us was they wanted us to evaluate the program, not just describe it, but to evaluate it in a rigorous, randomized clinical trial. So first I'll tell you what the program was about because I think that's especially important to give you an idea of how we were thinking first episode psychosis defined fairly broadly ought to be treated. And then what we'll do is talk about um, how we evaluated it and then finally um, what we found, which as you've already heard is now in press. Uh, in the American Journal, uh, American Journal of Psychiatry. So as I say, the overall goal is recovery. Not only are we doing team science, but we're talking about a team-based intervention. This is not looking for a magic bullet, that there's one thing we can do that's going to fix this problem. We're seeing it as a team-based approach. And the, the, the model you see here, um, a group of people who represent the team at the clinical site that provides the integrated treatment. And the fact of this, an important part of this, 
is we're not trying to design something in a test tube, again a mandate from NIMH, but to see services that can be generally more or less work within the current mental health reimbursement system so that the treatments that were provided were with very small exceptions that I'll talk about had to be paid for by the ongoing system. At the same time, what the RAISE initiative paid for was the research to develop the program and then to evaluate the program. And what we had was a general model for how treatment ought to be delivered, which is actually quite a modern model if you think about treatment when I first um, came into this field, which is um, a, a doctor proposes, patient accepts. So first of all, the term we used in our study, in our program, was client, and our overall model was one of shared decision making, which involved the team and the person, and very importantly, the families of people uh, who were part of the program. We develop manuals, uh, rather elaborate manuals if I do say so, and provided training and ongoing consultation. All team members, and as I've said, there was a project director, a psychiatrist or nurse practitioner prescriber, an individual resiliency training person who provided um, uh, the psychotherapeutic portion, and a family psychoeducation person. So we had a four-person team. And all of them were expected to have this set of skills. And what the skills are, they all reflect the notion of team, team building, and integration. This meant that in order to do this, there had to be team meetings. And I should mention, so that was a requirement, that there were weekly team meetings that were held that allowed all the, treat, all the members of the team to interact and to communicate about the person who was being cared for. And that's particularly important because I think, as we all know, um, uh, often treatments can be delivered in silos so that nobody, not one group doesn't know what the other part is doing, and that's not the best way for treatment to be delivered. Um, the components were, as I said, a psychopharm, psychopharmacologic treatment delivered by a prescriber, family treatment, individual resiliency training, which was our psychotherapy, and supported employment and education. I forgot to mention this, the SEE specialist. And this was a particularly important component. If you think about recovery, people want to get back to their real lives, and particularly at the time of the first episode of psychosis. Many people don't think of this as an illness, and in fact, it's not an illness, it's an experience that people are having. And these experiences are not things they necessarily are seeking treatment for. What they're seeking help with is getting back on track and back into life. Um, the family program was actually designed to be relatively brief, was designed as a 12-session program designed to begin soon after the person entered treatment and to include the client, relatives, and other important support people that might be in their lives. And it was coordinated with the individual resiliency training that I'll talk about in a few moments. The goals were to try to assess the, set, the situation that the person and the family found themselves in, provide education about the illness, and provide some skills in terms of how to deal with a person who's living with a first episode psychosis, and to provide families the skills to support and protect themselves at the same time. It's designed to be relatively brief, 12 to 15 sessions, and then to provide what we called monthly check-ins so that there would be ongoing support throughout the course of the treatment program. The treatment program was designed, is not designed with a fixed period. It's not 15 weeks, it's not 20 weeks, it's not 12 months, it's not a year and a half. The minimum exposure that we looked for was two years, 
but the expectation was that the intensity of treatment would fade as people reached milestones, made recoveries, and moved on to their lives. Our main goal here was not to engage people in treatment so that they became clients in perpetuity, but to foster recovery, as I've said before. Uh, individual resiliency training was, again, goal-oriented and specifically designed to build on strengths that individuals had. And as you've already heard from Andrew Solomon, he used the term resiliency in his talk, and I'm using it here again. An important feature, and I saw someone in the hallway earlier from uh, NIAAA, the National Institute on Alcohol, and uh, he said they were holding a workshop on resiliency today as well. So this is an important concept that we all use. We had a series of modules which were expected that everyone would experience, which include, included things like goal setting, developing resiliency especially, and then what we called individualized modules. And these were things that people could experience if they needed the particular issues. So there was an issue, if people had substance use issues, we could focus on those. And these were not designed in a sequence that you had to do module one before you did module two, before you did module three. They were available to the clinician in order to be able to provide them to people in the best way possible. Supported employment and education was one of the key features of the program. And this is a very, very valuable treatment, well, well documented in the literature. And one of the things that's important about, important about supported employment and education is that it's not designed on a vocational rehabilitation preparation for work. In other words, before we can let you go out into the community, take a job, you have to prove that you can come in on time, you have to be properly dressed, you have to do a wide range of pre-vocational activities. The goal of supported employment education is to provide supports that enable people to move into competitive employment or competitive education. In other words, back to school if they'd been students, back to work if they'd been working, or if they'd not been working, putting them into a work situation. It's a very, very important distinction, and it really resonates extraordinarily well with the young people who came into our program, because these were the things that they saw as their goals. The goals that we heard most often is, I want to move out of the house, I want to get a job, I want to get a car, and I want to get a girlfriend. And those were the things that we heard most frequently from people when they entered. Pharmacologic treatment. And as um, uh, our group has said uh, very much, first episode treatment for psychosis with medication, using the same medications that are used in schizophrenia and um, other serious mental illnesses more broadly, same antipsychotic medications. <coughs> treatment is the same but different. And these are some of the principles that are key here. One, most, two most important ones, that doses need to be much lower. And the second one is that um, side effects, even with much lower doses, are much more common. And so, therefore, the ability to deal with these two issues is very important. What we were doing here, because as I said, the goal of the NIMH RAISE program was to provide the treatment in community settings that already existed. We were not setting up specialized first episode programs. And so, therefore, the prescribers in these settings had extensive experience in using the medications that we were going to be using, but relatively limited experience with patients with first episode psychosis. And therefore, we developed a uh, manual and also a support system that would enable us to convey the information to clinicians. And this was a, a tool we called Compass. It seemed that Navigate and Compass went together. And Compass is an online decision support system that facilitates 
the decision making that's required here. It's a web-based application and it was available through the program. It could be done on a laptop, on a desktop, and then uh, in the middle of the program uh, we were able to provide our prescribers with um, iPads that they, could, uh, that they could use as well. And I'm not going to go through the details of this, but the, uh, the program <coughs> includes uh, uh, the decision support system includes two very important components. The first is a patient self-report and the purpose of this is to provide the individual with an opportunity to say how they're doing and how they're feeling. And that then feeds in seamlessly to the prescriber who then conducts an interview which is based on what the person has said. And I'll just give you one example. If the person says, I've been feeling depressed, then the clinician will ask, you've been feeling depressed, can you tell me a little bit more about that? If the person says, I haven't been feeling depressed, the prescriber will say, you said you haven't been feeling depressed, but I wonder, have you been feeling sad, <coughs> out of things, having a hard time getting started? So the person is always being heard, but all of the questions are being asked. And then finally, there's a selection of medications which is recorded. Um, what's really exciting for us um, is that we completed 3,939 3, of these assessments, which provide an enormous amount of data about prescriber, um, uh, client, patient interactions, and we've only begun to look at those. I'll just give you a couple of examples. So one of the questions that we ask people as part of the decision support is, do you want to change your medication? And um, of those 3,939, uh, about a quarter of the time people said yes, and in fact that changed over time so that they said less later in the course of the program than they did earlier, which suggests that what was happening is prescribers were starting to get it right or getting it right or not a real word. So let me now go on to say um, this is the program and the question is we developed it, um, um, we thought we knew how to deliver it, and the question now is does it work, all right? Is this going to be better? for people than what they're normally getting. And so what we did was to conduct a randomized controlled trial to compare Navigate to community care. By community care, what we meant was the care that was offered in clinics in the United States today. At the community care sites, we did no interventions, all right? And what we did was we did what we call what's called cluster or site randomization. Um, what that means is rather than having a study at a number of sites and in each study individuals are randomly assigned to receive one treatment or another, what we decided to do instead was to randomize the sites. That has a number of very important advantages that I'll talk about uh, in a minute. Um, uh, what we did was we set this up for a minimum of two years of assessment, but people who entered early had a longer period of time in the trial, and we did both on-site and remote assessment in order to protect the masked or blinded nature of the study. And so here we are in 21 states with 34 sites the groups that I identified earlier when I thanked them. And here's what we did. Uh, as I said, random assignment of sites, 30, 34 sites, 17 received Navigate, 17 received Community Care, and those are the numbers of patients, clients who entered the program. Ultimately, we had 404 people um, in the program. And here's what they had to be. These are the criteria. It had to be a first episode of psychosis. You'll notice there's a broad range of diagnostic criteria. We were bound by the diagnostic criteria, but the broad range gives us an opportunity 
uh, to look at a, uh, not just look at schizophrenia per se. And in order to be sure that we were early in the course of treatment, no more than six months of antipsychotic medication. Now the problem when you've done this kind of randomization and people are at a site and the site knows what it's doing, and indeed that was exactly what we wanted, we needed remote masked assessors and the people that we were working with actually not only were masked, blinded to which, which site had which treatment, they didn't even know very much about the, na they didn't know the nature of the study. All they knew was they were being asked to diagnose people with any of these psychosis disorders and they were being asked to use assessments that are commonly used in schizophrenia. So they knew that much. But beyond that, they didn't know what our goals were, what our outcomes of interest were, and so forth. So the summary of this is we think it's a relatively mod mo novel clinical trial model using site or cluster randomization and very, very well suited to treatment, to multimodal treatments that really can't be blinded well. And also, the kind of treatment we were delivering leads to something that can be called bleed. In other words, if you're a clinician at a site and you've learned how to provide a very interesting treatment to somebody that you're seeing, it's really hard to say when the next person comes in through your door, oh, no, 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 this guy doesn't get that. That's only for that person. And this avoids that problem. And it also avoids another really critical problem in randomized trials and very important in first episode psychosis. And that is people are often very reluctant to agree to treatment by toss of a coin. In other words, we have two treatments and you're either going to get one or the other. They very, very often walk away from it. In this study, they were told there are two kinds of sites. At your site, this is what you're doing, we're doing, and we'd like you to join. At the other sites, they were told this is what we're doing and we'd like you to join. So no patient had to agree to be randomized. The only people who had to agree to be randomized were the 34 sites, all of whom had said they would be willing to do either community care or navigate if they were assigned to it. And I have to tell you, we held, your bre we held our breaths when we revealed the, co the condition to which sites had been randomized because we were afraid that some sites would then say, ah, navigate, that's too much work. I don't want to do that. I was hoping to get the other. And some would say, community care, that means I'm not going to learn how to do this terrific new treatment. But as it turned out, and this is very important to me, no site refused to participate once they had been given their random assignment. So, so what did we learn? All right, that was the first. I've told you what we did, and now I'm going to tell you what we learned. First, who, who were these people? They were indeed young. The mean age was 23. And in many clinical trials today that are being done for new medications or for psychosocial treatments, we're seeing patients who are 40 years old who've had their first illness when they were 23, but who've now been ill for 15 years. Um, they were um, uh, um, more white, but indeed there were more African Americans in the pop in the study population than we would expect in the U.S. population, and that has to do with the fact of our going to public community mental health centers. In terms of working in school, um, what we had was that um, a, some proportion of patients, relatively low proportion, were working at the time they came into the study, and the vast majority had been hospitalized before coming to these community mental health centers. In terms of diagnosis, although we allowed this full range of diagnoses, by the time people came to these community mental health centers, they were, in fact, uh, more than 50 percent could meet a diagnosis of schizophrenia, which means that the illness had been ongoing for more than six months. 
So you will remember that I told you we had these four components to our treatment, and, the, and we had sites that did it and sites that didn't. So our first question was, what did people think they got? So we asked questions every month about a variety of things, but among the questions we asked were, have you had individual sessions with a mental health provider who helps you work on your goals and look positively toward the future? That's our code for individual result. That's translating what we thought of as individual resiliency training. And in all of the slides you're gonna see, uh, red is navigate and blue is community care. And what we see here is looking over the 24 months, um, clearly there's always a significant advantage for the Navigate group in that they believe they're getting more of this than do the people who are receiving community care. But this also f shows the thing I talked about earlier, which is these treatments are not etched in stone and they decline over time um, as uh, patients go through as clients go through the, the two-year period. So that's, the tw that's, that's individual resiliency training. And this is the family one. And here what you see is, again, uh, a significant difference between community care and Navigate. But one of the most important things here is that while in the previous slide, virtually every client experienced the individual resiliency training, only a portion of clients about saw about 50 percent experienced the family intervention and the reason for that I think is that even this early in the illness many clients have already become distanced from their families or their families have issues that make it difficult for them to engage uh, with the uh, client and with the team in treatment and then the third was asking about met with somebody who's helping you get a job in the community and here we get a job or go back to school we see the same kind of story and then finally um, the piece about the uh, pharmacologic intervention was were you asked to record your symptoms before you came in to see your <coughs> prescriber and you see here a very very high percentage of people who experience that through the two years and I should mention that our model for um, uh, pharmacologic treatment was we did not expect that to fade over time so in the last um, 10 minutes that I have I want to tell you about what we found so so far I've told you about what our treatment was like how we designed our study evidence that indeed we did manipulate the treatment difference between the two sets of sites and now the question is what did we learn what are our answers so the first point is that people who are receiving navigate stayed in treatment longer than people who were in community care and we know one thing we all know from um, anything that we've seen in the past is that if you're not there you can't get the help and people walk away that's a bad thing so we did a better job of keeping people in treatment in the navigate sites than we did in the community care sites the second thing is quality of life the quality of life scale which is a scale that addresses things like um, uh, self-perception getting on with friends and family work in school um, and the ability to participate in normal community activities it's a composite scale this was completed every six months as you can see here and what we see is that the navigate group started a little bit lower than the community care group and over time by the end of the treatment period at two years the sub the clients who received navigate were doing significantly better than those who received community care. This was our primary outcome, and we were, I, to say the least, we were thrilled uh, to see this finding. Um, the second issue has to do with, um, with, uh, with work and school, and this is a slightly more complicated picture, but again, if we look at the interaction, by the end of the two years, the Navigate group is um, actually doing 
just a little bit better than the community care group. This is not as dramatic a finding as the one we had um, uh, with quality of life. And when we look at um, uh, the symptom score, this is an instrument called the PANS, which is very widely used. What we see is that at six months, there's a significant advantage for the Navigate group. What this is telling us is that symptoms improve more rapidly, which is a very important kind of baseline uh, to set in order to see where you're going to go with um, uh, future um, uh, quality of life developments. But over time, the community care group um, uh, does about as well. In terms of depression, we see advantages for the Navigate group. I should say that in, in this case, um, the uh, Calgary Depression Rating School scores, a lower score is better, so the lower level is better, and that's where we see our advantage um, uh, for Navigate. Now we come to hospitalization. And we look at this, and uh, I don't have to tell anybody in this room, regardless of your statistical expertise, that those two lines are not different. There's no difference in hospitalization. And we, we pondered over this very long and very hard. And I want to show you the next slide, which is designed to put this into context. So here's our study over 24 months. And these are our, um, uh, our treatments. This is our intervention. And this is the treatment as usual. And these are all multimodal studies that were done in the field. In other words, studies that looked at a range of um, uh, outcome, at a range of treatments. So they were not just providing a pharmacologic treatment or a single psychosocial treatment. And what we see is 34, 37 over two years. STEP, is, which is a recent study conducted in New Haven, you see is a 12-month study. They've got 23 percent in their first year and 44 percent in the community group, in the group that didn't receive the treatment. OPUS does it year by year. This is a Danish study, and they've got 59 percent in the first year, 71 percent in the second. In the second year, it's down about to where we are, but that doesn't include what happened in the first year. Uh, Leo is, again, comparable to us in 15 months, but with about 50% in, the, in their comparison. And Ray's Connection, which is the other Ray's program, looking at their data for their first 12 months, what you see is 32% comparable to ours, and there wasn't a comparison group. That was a implementation demonstration project. So we had to think about this, and what we've come to the conclusion is that our community care sites are not treatment as usual. Our community care sites were f 17 sites that had said at the outset that if randomly assigned to deliver Navigate, that they could and would deliver that. So these were a group of sites that we'd selected very carefully and that also believed in the idea of an early intervention. We don't have details on what they did, but we believe that they did better than would a random selection of community sites in the United States. To their and our credit, and we're very grateful to them. So the other question is, nobody's average. Um, as Garrison Keillor has often said, um, uh, the women are strong, the men are good looking, and all the children are above average. Um, indeed, all the children are not above average. But what we were looking for was to examine important predictors of outcome. And we'll be doing much more work in this area, but what we did first was to look at the duration of untreated psychosis. And in this community clinic, these community clinics, and Tom actually already mentioned the number, the median duration of untreated psychosis was 74 weeks. That means half below, half above. 74 weeks before people came to any treatment, and that was not necessarily our treatment. 
So they'd had 74 weeks of psychosis untreated before they came to treatment, median split. And what we did was to see whether looking at those who were better than the median and those who were worse made a difference. And here's the finding. And what I want you to look at is this is the quality of life, and this is for those who had less than 74 weeks. And what you see is a huge effect for that group. And all the other three groups, the two community care groups and the group um, with Navigate with a longer duration of untreated psychosis, does not have as good an outcome. So this becomes a really important marker for us in many ways. We have a similar finding for the um, psychopathology score. You will remember I showed you that the symptoms only showed an effect at six months. When you look at it with duration of untreated psychosis, it goes throughout the entire 24-month period. So last minute for a few conclusions, and I really, really am looking forward to your comments. First, the recipients of Navigate were more likely to remain in treatment and received, had greater improvement in our primary outcome measure which was quality of life. They were more likely to be working or going to school, and they had a significant degree of symptom improvement in the first three months. Duration of untreated psychosis is an important moderator, predictor of Navigate success. And this is a very important finding for us because when we think about things that we might be able to change, perhaps at Google in the future, Think of things that we might be able to change. Duration of untreated psychosis is certainly something that we can strive for. So what, it's, what we've shown is that a coordinated specialty care program can be delivered in the community, that it can be successfully, well, it can be successfully delivered, it can be successfully evaluated, and it does have an effect. Have we changed the trajectory of illness for people with first episode psychosis? We don't know. We've seen an effect at two years. We're currently engaged in a follow-up, which will take these clients out to five years after initial engagement. And I know that John or I or someone else on our team will be very happy to come and speak to the Alliance and tell them what we know at that point. Thank you for your attention.